And that's true, I can put it another way. Um, Django is very top of the moon. And the thing about it is that Django blows away the slave market. And as far as I know, a lot of people see this movie and they think, man, that's pretty good. It ain't bad, it's pretty good. <laughs> right? So, you know, I'd rather they tell the truth about black revolt and how black people won the Civil War. After the Emancipation Proclamation, 80% of the troops were black. And Sherman's march through Georgia, they always go on about Sherman being so awful. Hey, black folks rose up and burned down the plantations in Georgia. They don't tell you that so much. New book by Bruce Levine, Simon Blake's the School, called The Fall of the House of Dixie. You know, now a lot of people in academia and in Hollywood and in politics in work at overtime produce the full story, the racing story. Right? Gone with the wind. Birth of a nation. The fact is, they ask any black folks, they can find a lot of white folks. They could find out the truth, but they didn't publicize their views. They don't publicize the truth. It takes a fight to find out the truth. And it doesn't every single society, every single society has the emperor's new clothes. And there's somebody just like you said, but wait a minute, they ain't wearing no clothes. You're talking about all the clothes, but they ain't got no clothes. He covered himself up. That's pretty close to it. So I started working on this, and I found a very good book by a great historian, Gary Nash, called Race and Revolution. And it was pretty amazing. And on page 60, he says a gigantic number of slaves, you will never know how many, escaped to the British side and were free in exchange for fighting for freedom. And then he gives five reasons why gradual emancipation should have occurred throughout the country, not just in the North, after the revolution. And then roughly he says it didn't happen because the North has no damn book. And he runs away. Pages 60, 61. And so I stopped because I've always heard that the American Revolution was no big deal. And the Civil War, where slavery was a central issue in the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, that was a big deal. And I had studied revolution. I even wrote a book on Karl Marx's activity in the Revolution of 1848, so I know what's going on. So this struck me as news. And I figured I'd better go look at it. So I spent about, oh, I don't know, 10 years going to 16 research libraries. And I went through various experiences trying to get this published by commercial presses in history. And I had a very complicated thing getting this published, but it was published finally at the University of Chicago the Press, and I the number one book in history for this past year, which always gets reviewed in the New York Times. And it's had a lot of success uh, since the second period. And I got put it out of paper. And it's, yeah, it's 30 bucks a throw, which is a lot of money, but compared to ordinary books put out by university presses, which are 75 to 100 bucks a throw, um, they at least made an effort. The New York Times wouldn't have it. The New York Times will now acknowledge that Jefferson, somebody could say, Jefferson's the monster of Monticello. They can't tell you the following fact. There's a German private named Georg Daniel Four walked around the field of York. I don't know how much history you have. I don't think it's much history. Yorktown was the central battle of the American Revolution and was the one that was from Wallace was defeated. It was the defeat of the British. The Americans created the first new nation. When they, when they uh, started rebelling, they used to joke around that, you know, we're probably going to end up swinging from trees. And, uh, you know, one, one guy said to another, one guy said to another, you know, well, you're fat, so you go fast. And maybe I'm thinking, won't be so bad for me. But, George Daniel Floor was a German private who fought with the French, the oil and the home, on the Patriot side, on the American side of the world. And he walked around the field of battle Latin, and he wrote in his diary in German, which was published in a very obscure journal by a professor who teaches at Hope College in Moravian University in Michigan, not a famous university, not a famous guy. But he read this, and he was right, because I read it too. 
the guy said was, I walked around the field of battle afterwards, and most of the corpses were Mauron, Moors, blacks. Most of the corpses on both sides of Yorktown, both for the British and for the Americans. Now, perhaps you've heard I have some correspondence on that bar with people who are descendants of black soldiers in the revolution. And they try to get into the doors of the American Revolution, which is really good, an outstandingly racist organization for them. And the sons of the American Revolution. And man, it's like getting through the eyes of needle. How do you in the They do like it. They get in four or five years, all kinds of grief, lawsuits, very funny stuff. This year, on July 4th, two black women in Queens formed a chapter from several states and daughters of the American Revolution with 11 people was half black. They got some grief from their friends about forming this completely formed chapter of a racist organization for them. But they felt like, well, we're patriots too. And that's the way they treated me. I've never seen black folks before, about 5,000 on the American side. The daughters of the American Revolution is all this complaint. Now about two genealogists who found that there are 8,800 blacks and Native Americans who fought on the American side, and that's real world fashion. Probably do. So, a lot of history is getting wiped out here. <laughs> the most interesting thing about it, just this what my book shows, is that in the American Revolution itself, not in the Civil War, Black soldiers were the center of the American victory at Yorktown, as they were the central fighters for the British. And it turns out that black folks, you know, you can almost you know, you pay attention to the New York Times, so on, but just, you know, the political atmosphere in which Django could be made, that's a new film, man. If you say that really the slave owners ought to be done in, it's fine. I prefer nonviolence myself. I don't think we're going to have a world war. But as far as it goes, as a matter of justice, I rather like that. And one of my heroes is John Brown. And I will just say, the favorable movie about John Brown was yet to be made. Right? And I wanted to pick the fanatic thing about John Brown. So I'll tell you, being fanatic about slavery, I'm sorry. That's the only way to be about slavery. Right? You may be scared. Right? There's a reason why a lot of people didn't develop. They were real nasty to slavery. But it would have been very good if slavery had been put out of business, not only in the North, but in the South during the American Revolution. And my book is about how it's possible that could have happened during the American Revolution. Because the British, Governor Dunmore of Virginia, <clears throat> said, you proud rebels, in 1772, three years before the revolution started, you rebelled. And I am going to summon all the slaves and indentured servants to my side and free them. And I am going to sow destruction wherever I can reach. And I am going to raise your mansions to the ground. The whole South rebelled three years later, because that's when he issued his proclamation, to preserve slavery. They thought the British were going to end slavery. There were several other things that were going on in Britain that were going to end slavery. And in a Parallel to the Civil War, 80 years before, the whole South rebelled to keep slavery. That was his primary motivation. Virginia had a few other complaints. South Carolina didn't. The big slaveholding states, hey man, they ain't many white folks here, and they slip you a lot of slaveholders. Better watch out. <laughs> now, the other thing about it, however, is that a lot of American historians have not written about this because, as Gary Nash says, it is the dirty secret of the American Revolution that blacks played a central role on the British side. And black abolitionists wrote about this, trying to inspire the world. Um, William Nell, who's the greatest of this on his and he And a bunch of them. But they couldn't talk about the blacks in the Britain, right? Because you wouldn't get a lot of enthusiasm on the part of the Union if you'd be pushing that one. So actually, they're a little cautious, and they didn't quite say what was going on. And there are complicated, there's a complicated history, I'm sure you know, that, about how black historians have written about this and how white historians have written about this. 
But it is the dirty secret of the American Revolution. So since the Civil Rights Movement, a lot of people have been writing about pieces of it. It's like pieces. And you see, I'm a political philosopher in another field. So I got into the obvious problem. So I really studied that. I do some history anyway. I spent 16 years of this one now. Definitely in the story, also. And so I went to all these research libraries and I had the right question, which is, is there evidence about black people fighting? And I found the most amazing documents, the incredible thing, which is all in my book. But anyway, here's the other side of the story. I figured, I discovered this thing, which is really interesting. The best thing in the American Revolution is the gradual emancipation of the world. Independence was a fight for freedom. The most oppressed people in the United States were slaves. Indigenous people, too, but slaves. Right? So if you were for freedom, being for emancipation is like being serious. So Samuel Johnson, the great British essay, he wrote an essay called Taxation. He meant the tax on tea and stamp paper. Ta taxation, no tyranny? Oh, okay. oh. You weren't signaling. <laughs> no, I, no, I was just listening. <laughs> I, okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure you weren't signaling. Oh, no. Taxation, no tyranny. He wrote, how come we hear the greatest yelps for liberty from the drivers of slaves? That means you, Tom Jefferson. And a Quaker in New Jersey, David Cooper, said, it is amazing to read the Declaration of Independence and its proclamation of the equality of all men. And then to discover that by all men, they mean white men and that they're upset about a three-penny tax on tea, but not the slavery of a human being for her whole life. Mm. Now, there are a lot of things you don't get to know as a person who studies American history. I mean, one. Yeah, I never heard that phrase. You don't get to know. It's not sort of like the tea party. The minute something is said, it's gone. Right? It has less lasting value than the newspapers. There is nothing of any interest that has been said by any member of the people that I'm aware of. And now, I should say, if you consider Ron Paul part of the Tea Party, uh, Ron Paul does say some good things in foreign policy. He often says some better things than, than, than Barack on foreign policy, so he won't be out of his mind. A bit racist domestically, he might be somebody to be looked at. But one of the things about the American side was there were a lot of people, Christians, for example, who said every loss we have is because slavery is the words of Samuel Hopkins, a new white minister in morality. Slavery is a sin of sins and God. We're practicing slavery, that's why we're using it. So we've got to stop practicing. And the British were recruiting blacks to fight. And Washington was very upset about this. He said their strength will go, grow like a snowball and rolling. So on the American side, they started recruiting blacks in Rhode Island. And they formed the first Rhode Island Regiment of Black and Narragansett Indians. And they fought for five years. So those who stayed in and didn't desert, they were pretty experienced fighters. So the, another German advisor to Washington, Baron von Colson, reviewed there were a quarter of Washington's troops at Yorktown. He reviewed the First Rhode Island Regiment, a couple other black regiments, and he said, these were the cheerfulest, the sturdiest, and the best of the news. And the reason for this is the rest of Washington's forces were militias that formed up for 10 months. So you be a militia, form up for 10 months, you're going to get out. 